Hi everyone, in this video we're going over the derivative product rule. Now sometimes we can recognize that a particular function is just a product of two simpler functions. Like in this case, where I have this p of x function, um, maybe this p of x function is defined to be just the product of two other functions, which we'll name f and g. Now if you want to find the derivative of that p function, there's actually a shortcut that can help us with finding that derivative. We call that the derivative product rule. And so there's two different ways to write this. We can either say that the derivative with respect to x of f times g is equal to the derivative of f with respect to x times g plus the f times the derivative of g with respect to x. Or if I wanted to say exactly the same thing, but just using different notation, again, we'll let some function p be the product of two functions f and g, and then say, well, if I want to take the derivative of the product of those two functions, it would just be f prime g plus f g prime. And so this is something that you need to memorize, either what I have up there in that blue box or in that orange bracket here, you know, memorize one of those two things um, because it's going to be very important. Here's an example, right? So sometimes talking about it ex abstractly doesn't really help, but once you see an example, everything seems to, to sort of click. And so if I have this function p of x, maybe we recognize right away that p of x is just the product of this factor which I might name f, and this factor over here, which I might name g. So you can see how it's, this p of x function would just be f times g. And if I want to take the derivative, and this is what the question is asking me to do, is find this derivative, um, which I can denote p prime for the derivative, um, what I'm going to have to do is just rely on this product rule. So I'm going to set p prime is equal to f prime g plus f g prime. Now if f is what I've underlined over there, f is x squared minus 5, that means that f prime, the derivative with respect to x, will be 2x, and then of course the derivative of negative 5 is just 0 because negative 5 is a constant. And likewise, if I consider g to be what I put in brackets over there, which is 3x plus 2, g prime, which is the derivative of g with respect to x, is just the number 3. And again, um, all I really needed to use here was the power rule. And uh, hopefully these are becoming second nature with enough practice, but also uh, the derivative homogeneity rule, and the derivative additivity rule as well. But now that I know what f prime is and what g prime is, it makes this formula easy to use. So f prime is just 2x times g. Well, g is 3x plus 2, plus f is x squared minus 5, times g prime, which is just 3. And if I just do a little bit of distributing now, 2x times 3x is going to be 6x squared. Uh, 2x times 2 is going to be plus 4x, plus 3 times x squared is 3x squared, and then 3 times negative 5 is minus 15. And the last thing I'll do here is collect like terms, and so it looks like 6x squared plus 3x squared is 9x squared. And I've got plus 4x minus 15. And so what I've done here in green pen is figured out how to use the product rule to take the derivative of this p of x function. And so hopefully you saw the steps there and that all clicks and makes sense. Now, I want to point out something, and what I'm about to show you is that you didn't have to use the derivative product rule here. What we could have done is we could have actually just multiplied those two binomials in my original p of x function, 
And so multiplying these two binomials would give me 3x cubed, and I take x squared times 3x, and then if I take x squared times 2, that would be plus 2x squared. And if I take negative 5 times 3x, that's minus 15x. And if I take negative 5 times 2, that would be minus 10. So this is the same thing as what I started out with, that p of x function, but then I actually multiplied those two binomials, and now I have a cubic polynomial with four terms. And now if I just go term by term and take the derivative of each one, the first term in my derivative will be 9x squared using our power rule. And the next term will be 4x. And then the next term will be minus 15. And of course the negative 10 is just a constant so that goes away. And notice that we actually got the same result whether we used our power rule um, here in purple, or whether we use the product rule here in green. All right, so there's two different methods, and just maybe if you are taking an exam in this course and you have this type of problem, one really good way to check your work and make sure that you're going to, uh, you know, get the question right and really ace the exam, one way to check your work would be to work this derivative two different ways. You know, try the try the purple method and the green method, and make sure you get the you know the same answer both ways. That would be an excellent way to make sure you're getting the right answer here. Here's another example. So I'm going to use um, the product rule to find the derivative of y with respect to x. And so this is what I'm talking about: the derivative of y with respect to x. And here. I see this y function, the function that describes the value of y, as being the product of f and g. So I've underlined what a, two factors I'm going to choose as f and g. And so to do this, to write out my product rule, I'll just write out f is square root x, which means that f prime is what? Well, if you remember our lesson about the power rule. Remember square root x is just x to the one half power. So power rule tells me that this is going to be one half x to the negative one half power, which you could, if you wanted to, you could write this as one over two root x. Okay, then for g, my g function is three x to the fourth minus x minus five. And my g prime function is going to be then 12x cubed minus 1. And so the, the product rule is telling me is that this product of functions, when I take the derivative, I'm going to get f prime g plus fg prime. And so f prime is going to be... Uh, one half x to the negative half power times g, and g is 3x to the fourth minus x minus 5 plus f, and f is just x to the half power, times g prime, which is 12x cubed minus 1. And there's some distributing to be done here. Right, so maybe I can uh, start over here and maybe I can use what's left of my page here to finish the problem. But if I do 1 half x to the negative half power times 3x to the fourth power, 1 half times 3 becomes 3 halves. And then x to the fourth times x to the negative 1 half is going to become x to the power 3 and a half because, you know, four minus a half gives you three and a half. Then I have um, one half x to the negative half power times negative x, so that will become negative one half x to the half power. And then this times negative five gives me negative five halves x to the negative half power plus 
x to the half power times 12x cubed is going to be 12x to the 3 halves power and then uh, minus x to the half power. So we still have to collect like terms and so uh, I'm not quite done yet. I want to do, I want to draw a little line here to make this easier to tell the lines of my work apart from one another. So there's, you know, the previous line and the next line. And then I'm going to go ahead and write the solution that we came up with um, in blue, but maybe just a slightly lighter blue whenever we collect like terms. So I have two terms that have an x to the 3 halves power. So that's going to be 12 plus 3 halves. There's 12 plus 1 and a half. That would be 13 and a half times x to the 3 halves power. I have a couple of terms that have x to the 1 half power. And so that would be negative 1 and a half x to the 1 half power. So negative 1 and a half x to the 1 half power. And then I have uh, one term that has x to the negative half power. And this would be totally fine. What you, I have written in teal here, this is a solution that I would consider to be simplified enough that I would give you full credit if you had this solution. But if you remembered that, um, you know, the half power is just the square root, one more way you could write this would be 13 and a half x to the 3 fifths power minus 1.5 square root x minus 5 over 2 root x. But that's optional. That's just another way that you might see this represented. Let's, um, just out of curiosity, let's try to multiply these first and then try the power rule version. And I recognize that we use the power rule on the right side when we were using the product rule as well. But let's just try multiplying these out. So sticking with my original function of y, um, but remembering that root x is just x to the half power times 3x to the fourth minus x minus 5. And I multiply x to the half in here. My new function is 3x to the 4 halves power minus, um, let's see, x to the one and a half power minus five x to the half power. And then finally taking the product rule, sorry, not the product rule this time, we're doing the, pro the power rule for each term this time. Um, three times four and a half is gonna give me 13 and a half. And then I bring down the exponent by one. Um, and then I bring down this exponent, one and a half times x, and I bring down that exponent by one. And then I'm going to, again, bring down the one half exponent, so this becomes five halves, and then I reduce the exponent by one, and that should look familiar. That's actually the same solution that we got uh, using our product rule that we're just learning. So <clears throat> I wanna jump in with some commentary right here, some editorializing. I wanna point out that it's actually faster, or it seems to be faster, whenever I solved example one in the purple method versus whenever I solved example one in the green method. So it was faster when I didn't use this product rule, right? So whenever I, I, I did you know the workaround and I, I chose not to use this product rule, it was actually faster. And in example two, same thing. When I used this new derivative product rule, which I'm introducing in this video, it actually took me uh, more time to solve than whenever I just multiplied these two factors and then took the derivative. So I want you to notice that and know that when you see a, a product of two functions, you don't have to use the product rule. Um, and in fact, I personally think that it would be silly in this situation. So again, just speaking in, in real talk here, if it were me and I were writing a textbook about calculus, I definitely would not introduce the product rule at this point. However, we're going to learn in later sections of the text that uh, there are some there are some derivatives where you can't just multiply through quite so easily. 
we're going to see functions that are the product of polynomials and exponential functions. And we're going to want to take those derivatives. And in that case, we have to use the product rule. And there's not going to be any way around it. So I'm just sort of um, prepping you for that and, and pointing out that, yes, in these examples, the product rule is, is silly and unnecessary. But there will come a point in this course where we do have to use the product rule. So with that said, let's do one more example of how you might use this product rule. I'll start off in purple. And the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this function, f of t, um, by writing 4t cubed plus 7t squared. And what it means for this whole thing to be squared is that I multiply it times itself. So this is what it should look like if I just expand it out a bit. So now this is the product of two things. Um, you know, I could label this f and I can label this g. And I want to point out that f and g are the same thing. They are simply 4t cubed plus 7t squared. And that means f prime and g prime will be the same thing. That's going to be 12t squared plus uh, 14t. Knowing this, we can apply our uh, product rule to find the derivative here. And I see something that I've done um, that maybe looks a little bit silly to you. And kudos if you caught this. But whenever I was introducing the product rule, I introduced it the way that I remember it. I always remember the product rule as being f prime g plus f g prime, where f is one of the factors. And in this case, I gave you a function f that's actually just the product of two functions. And so maybe, just for the purposes of working this problem, what I sh should do is rename this function uh, maybe perhaps z of t, just to give it a new name while I work it. And that way, I don't confuse myself with, uh, you know, the whole f being the name of one of my factors. So let's call this z of t, z or z prime of t for the derivative. And this is going to be f prime g plus f g prime. And f prime is going to be 12t squared plus 14t times g. g is 4t cubed plus 7t squared. And then I'm going to add f g prime. But actually, because g prime is the same thing as f prime and f is the same thing as g, this will have the same effect as if I just multiply by 2 because I'm adding together two of exactly the same thing because that and that should be identical. If you don't believe me, try it yourself. But what I'm telling you is, since these two terms are identical, I'm just going to multiply by 2 instead of writing out more work than I have to. Always better to work smarter rather than to work harder. And now let me um, sort of foil this out. So 12 times 4 is going to be 48. And then the first term will be t to the fifth. And 12t squared plus 7t squared well, 12 times 7 is 84. And that's going to be t to the fourth. 14 times 4 is the same thing as 7 times 8. So that's 56 t to the fourth. And then we have plus 14 times 7, which is 98 uh, t cubed. So that is our derivative, which in the original language of the problem we would write as f prime of t. But I changed the name of f prime to z prime, just so I didn't confuse myself. But in any case, this is, this is the answer that we were looking for. You could, um, of course, you could try it the other way with the power rule. But um, just to save time in this video, I'll skip that. The last thing I want to get down to is why do we believe that this power rule works? And what I mean by that is that if I have some function p, which is just f times g, why would I think 
that p prime should be, uh, you know, f prime g plus f g prime. Why are we so convinced that this is true for any two functions that we're uh, multiplying? So what I will present to you is a proof, and I'll try to do this as quickly and as painlessly as I can. And so I will first remind you of the definition of the derivative, which is the limit as h approaches 0 of your function, in this case p, evaluated at x plus h, minus the function evaluated at x divided by h. So this is the definition of the derivative. And um, let's remember my p function over here is just the product of two functions, which I'm calling f and g, where f is a function of x and g is a function of x. So I can rewrite this whole thing as the limit as x approaches 0 of, whenever I write p of x plus h, this is going to be f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus, and then when I write p of x, that's just f of x times g of x, all divided by h. And it's at this point that I want to have a little sidebar, and I want to introduce this fact, which I think everyone will quickly agree with. And that is, I want to point out that if I have negative f of x plus h times g of x, and then I add to it positive f of x plus h times g of x, that this would just be equal to 0, because those two are going to cancel each other out. And also, this is maybe goes without saying, but if you just add 0 to anything, it doesn't change the value. And so I should be allowed to add 0 to anything. So I can actually insert these two terms, because they cancel, out, you know, because they cancel each other out, um, anywhere I want um, into this limit. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to write kind of small so that this will fit. But I'm taking the limit as h approaches 0 again. And in the numerator, I write f of x plus h times g of x plus h. And then here is where I'm going to insert that sequence that I wrote up there. Minus f of x plus h times g of x plus f of x plus h times g of x. And then I will continue with f of x plus f of x, no, sorry, minus f of x, g of x. Ah, and I know that's not legible down there in blue, but I really don't want to rewrite this. So in blue, it's minus f of x times g of x. And then the denominator here for this limit stays the same as h. Starting over, way over here on the left, I'm going to rewrite my limit again. And what I want to point out is that in these first two terms here, uh, I have a common factor between the two of them. And that common factor is this f of x plus h. So let me factor out an f of x plus h from the first two terms. And then what I have remaining is going to be g of x plus h minus g of x. And then for my last two terms here, I want to point out another common factor. And that common factor is g of x. So I can actually factor out a g of x out of those last two terms. And what that's going to look like is um, plus g of x 
times what remains, and that is f of x plus h from the second to last term, and the very last term is minus f of x times g of x. And so that is going to do it for this step of algebra. And I'm going to take quite a few steps here. Still keeping the same limit as h approaches 0, but over here I'm going to take that f of x plus h and put it kind of conspicuously out in front instead of up top in the numerator. And then I will draw this here. And what goes up top is going to be g of x plus h minus g of x. And I'm going to split this fraction right here. Right here where this plus sign is, I'm going to split this fraction apart and keep the same denominator. And so this will look like plus I'm going to write that g of x out front instead of up top, and then I'm going to multiply by f of x plus h minus f of x. And so maybe for some of you, the bells are already ringing here, because what's left to do is a couple of limit rules. So I can always split apart a limit where I'm multiplying two things, like where I'm multiplying this f of x plus h times that ratio, and this g of x plus h times this other ratio, and I can split apart a limit in the middle here where I have that plus sign where I'm adding two terms. And so just very briefly hang with me while I write four individual limits that say practically the same thing, but the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h um, times the limit as h approaches 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x over h plus the limit as h approaches 0 of g of x times the limit as h approaches 0 of, let's see, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Ha. Okay. And so this is going to be the last step and the last thing I say in this video. So looking forward to the end here. Um, this right here, when I let h become 0, this just becomes f of x. Switching colors. This part right here, I'm underlining in red, that limit as h approaches 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x over h, that's just the definition of the derivative of g. That's just g prime x. So then I have plus, and what I'm about to underline here in orange, the limit as h approaches 0 of just g of x, well, there's no h in g of x, so that's just g of x. Easy limit there. And then the last thing I have, which I'll put in purple, the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, that is just the definition of the derivative of my f function. And so what did we get in the end? Well, what we found, to summarize, is that p prime, the, the basically the product of these two functions, remember, is just equal to f g prime plus f prime g. You, you know, you can rearrange that. <laughs> the way I wrote it originally was f prime g plus f g prime. And, you know, both addition and multiplication are commutative, so that is just, you know, rock solid proof that you can trust and believe in your derivative product rule from this lesson. Okay, thanks for sticking it through to the end, and I'll see you in the next video.